It's like Kung Fu, instead of you punching me, I know what's happening and I'm gonna act accordingly. I know what to do with your punch. I will just send it right back to you. Por mucho tiempo hemos dormido Pero con miedo de soñar con muchos cínicos diciendo Nada podemos alcanzar Pero si sí se puede I'm Valerie Alzaga and I'm a labor organizer. Uh, uh, right now I work for Change to Win, which is uh, one of the two American labor confederations. Uh, I work for the global department uh, of um, uh, Change to Win. Um, I actually originally come from Mexico, then migrated to the United States, um, and I began my union work uh, with the Justice for Janitors campaign um, in Colorado and then in California. And the Justice for Janitors campaign was a campaign that really, uh, we can say, was one of the campaigns that really turned around uh, kind of the decline and painful uh, attack on unions. Uh, the Justice for Janitors campaign was, was a reinvention, if you will, of the best practices uh, of the American community organizing model um, and also kind of, you know, uh, uh, the idea that we needed to begin organizing uh, the, the service sector, which you know is something that a lot of unions haven't globally really decided to do. Uh, we know that um, the labor movement worldwide is in a major decline, uh, both in, in a decline of membership but in a decline of density, which means as a lot of these industries grow and employment grows, union becomes, as they're dying, we become less and less relevant. And I think in the United States, um, you know, SEIU, which is the union that, that um, created the Justice for Janitors campaign, really wanted to answer several questions. One was that we needed to focus on growing industries, in particular the service sector industries. Uh, cleaning was one of them, security, multi-service. Um, uh, but also how to win density, begin not only to get members uh, randomly, but very systematically try to control the industry again. Uh, so for us, the Justice for Janitors campaign, one, uh, was able to really increase membership in a, in a, in a very serious way. Um, and then from cleaning, we moved to security, and today we're about 260,000 workers, very well organized in most of the markets all over the United States, uh, in the biggest cities. Um, so the Justice for Janitors campaign also brought another, another important piece forward, I think politically for the unions, which was to organize migrants, uh, the majority of them undocumented. So it was a moment where unions, instead of blaming immigrants, actually decided we need to raise everybody, including the sectors in which undocumented immigrants and their vulnerability by their status you know, is being used for a higher exploitation. Um, the cleaning uh, industry had a very big shift in the 80s um, before workers were employed directly to the clients or to the buildings but then subcontracting began happening outsourcing, offshoring, as, as these kind of neoliberal uh, changes in the market were happening, what you had then is that cleaning companies were outsourced, they compete with each other in a very, very aggressive way, and that really basically brought the standards down, and this kind of pressure, this kind of uh, um, free market competition really, really was paid by the workers back, if you will. So, you know, the conditions were quite difficult, um, and one other thing that was important was that um, workers were in many different workplaces, very desegregated and with a very, very low density. So we didn't have a lot of workers organized. Um, so the model tried to, one, kind of think through uh, how we were going to organize the base itself, the, 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 the worker base. And so for us, uh, the issue of mapping and cartography, both in the workplace, uh, to understand who the workers are, how many they are, what is the level you know, of issues that they face, etc. But also understand the workers not only inside of the workplace, but understand uh, the workforce outside of the workplace. So also mapping uh, where they 
they lived and you know what churches they went to and what you know other organizations they they were part of so to think of the workers not as workers but to think of the workers as a multi multiplicity of uh, of beings of of uh, identities and 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 so on so uh, the mapping both of the workplace the mapping of um, uh, you know where workers reproduce their lives outside of the workplace are fundamental tools for us to do a very good very good job of actually organizing people so we spend a lot of time really educating folks and by questions you know because they know how this is organized we basically a lot of our organizing is asking the right questions so workers get to these answers themselves um, in a lot of home visits. In the home visits, a lot of the work we're trying to do is identify through the workers who are the most respected organic leaders in their own social fabrics inside the workplace. So for us, uh, finding this organic leadership is our job in a way, because uh, the most important part is identify the strongest people in a workplace and bring them together, form committees, worksite committees, that then link with other uh, committees or other um, worker representatives from the other buildings and that creates what we call an organizing committee but it's based very much on the idea that we gotta go identify the strength the strength in the workplace not necessarily a union strength or a leftist strength but the strength of people respecting each other and having social social linkages so this 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 work for us organizers is to identify both the issues the organic leadership and then to develop a campaign out of that with these committees actually making the decisions going through the process of then themselves organizing the rest of the workers, right? So for us it's important this process of how we build the actual workplace strength has to be with um, the idea that, um, uh, you know, the unions usually spend something like, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent of their, 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 their resources actually servicing individual problems, right? And servicing what we would say the weakest link in the workplace, the people in trouble, the people that are facing major problems. We cannot switch the model to say the union's main resources have to be in finding the strength, organizing that strength, and then moving forward in a campaign process with that strength. The other thing we do, uh, I think, quite well is the cartography or the mapping of possible uh, allies, possible supporters. Um, and this is a cartography that we also do with workers around, you know, what organizations and institutions they belong to. So this is where basically workers in these committees begin to talk to their churches, begin to talk to other immigrant right organizations, students, etc. We do a cartography of who we can possibly work with because we know that in terms of putting pressure on these clients and the companies, the workers by themselves are strong, but obviously they are stronger when and if we create a social movement, uh, a struggle where everybody's involved, including their neighbors including their churches, including, you know, uh, students or, uh, you know, women rights organizations, etc., etc. So most of the time our fights are not about just money, but uh, kind of bigger concepts, you know, yeah, rising out of poverty, which includes includes money, but it also means that migrant communities have a better chance, right, at uh, having a dignified life. So uh, most of our, our campaigns are really linked to these bigger kind of uh, social uh, demands and principles that we know anybody on the street would agree with. The other thing we do is we do a mapping and a very deep research of our adversaries, of the employers and especially the clients to understand precisely how they work, uh, what is their agenda, are they trying to get more contracts, where are they trying to get more contracts, you know, which are the strongest contracts, which are the, their most important clients, how, how wealthy are these clients, who in these companies and client you know, uh, base that we're we're trying to fight uh, against, uh, who are they? How can we interject their own lives? So it's, it's also about space, it's also about us uh, formulating struggles that are not just you know outside of the workplace, but we take this str strength, both the workers kind of very well organized, and the supporters, and we actually 
uh, map out uh, how to, if you will, uh, put pressure in the space where the wealthy, where the clients, where these particular people are. Um, the methodology of a campaign also has different phases. So the first one is usually base building, which we spend most of our time. Actually, one phase before that is research and mapping and developing a message and so on and so forth. But after we're ready, then we organize the workers. And most of our campaigns spend a lot of time really trying to do deep organizing to try to get people to join, high density, good committees, and a very broad participation by workers in a very organized way. So it's not by any means spontaneous. Um, this, the, the third phase of the campaign is usually when we're strong and we have a series of events to, to, to bring our uh, internal strength together, to measure our, our strength. Once we're ready to go, we go public and this is where we begin actually the public fight. And most of our fights you know, are usually the first part of our mobilizations. The idea is that the methodology is not only an escalating methodology, but that the pressure that we need to put on, on the key market players has to be done in a multi-directional way. So it means that the workers are doing one level of pressure, but maybe our allies, our supporters, can do another level of pressure, right? So the churches themselves can go and delegate on their own. Uh, or, you know, students can actually do, uh, you know, come to our, our actions or in a way kind of um, you know, do fax blasts or, you know, email blasts. So we also have a, a layer of internet activism that usually, you know, the young people can, can help us both being with us in demonstrations, but at the same time being able to do other types of pressure uh, processes. We also try to do other kinds of, 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 of pressures. So, you know, regulatory, the media, uh, you know, legal, especially if they be violating workers' rights, we definitely, you know, bring a lot of all the violations of labor they've done, but we do it collectively and we do it with media and we do it with our supporters. So, you know, nothing is kind of dispersed. Everything is methodologically put together to create this very escalating pressure, right? From, multi, from multiple directions um, that actually escalates to a moment of compression and then what we call the crisis, which usually involves, at least in the United States, strikes, but also civil disobedience, which is a very American, uh, you know, civil rights movement uh, uh, a beautiful uh, tool because it's not only about the strike, but it's bringing the conflict to a higher level. You know, so either you know you you block the highway or well, not the highway necessarily, but you know, sometimes we've tried to <laughs> block the LA highway, but mainly you know uh, big streets in in Los Angeles and and bringing the the story forward, right? But our organizing is usually at large scales because we cannot only organize one cleaning company because then we render them uncompetitive. We make them very expensive by themselves. So you can't just go to one workplace, you can't just go to one company. You have to have a market approach in order to raise the whole standard together, right? Um, maybe we do it one company at a time, but the idea is that you have an overall market strategy, you know? And from now to 10 years, I think just as for janitors can, can, can you know, the model itself, um, it's very good at situating workers in the industry. They understand precisely who they are, where they're standing, the mechanism in terms of exploitation, if you will, but also the way out, which is an idea of organizing across the market and that they are linked and responsible for the next ones to organize. So obviously the best leadership that emerges out of these struggles are the ones that then will be organizing the next sector or the next area or the next company or however you break you know, your plans down. What, has, what, what these kind of campaigns have done, uh, and I say you in particular, is that for a long time we developed a very good reputation in terms of like what a union needed to be. Um, students, when they came and, and, and supported the campaigns, then they began thinking about their own labor conditions, or they began thinking, oh, I want to study to be an organizer or a researcher, right? We have uh, a lot, a lot of union researchers, that their job is actually to understand the adversaries or the clients better than they understand themselves. So we have had a lot of students that have participated in the struggle that ended up becoming union researchers or like myself, you know, uh, that I come from the social movement, Zapatismo, anti-globalization, I ended up kind of like through this campaign saying, wow, this is a place I could work. Why? Because we're organizing immigrants, you know, that are undocumented, we're fighting, this is a direct action, this is serious campaigning, we're hitting multinational corporations, 
this is globalization. Globalization from below, globalization from above, and us being able to win something very, very determinately. And again, we come from a, from a background, organizational speaking of community organizing. So these are methods that, you know, both the community organizing like uh, techniques of the 1960s, if you will, uh, where, you know, the civil rights movement brought a bunch of people together. So again, this is models going back to the origin, if you will, both of union organizing and this kind of community organizing approach, um, but also a lot of the immigrants that actually started Justice for Janus were from a lot of different um, social and, and, and political movements. So we had a lot of, you know, basically immigrants that came from, you know, they were Sandinistas or FMLNistas or, you know, they came from the Guatemalan, uh, you know, r political refugees from the Civil War and so on. So you had this kind of combination of methods that were both, you know, kind of old school plus this, this, this organization de base, right, uh, in Central America or something, and then obviously a methodology, right? So this is why this is very potent because it has kind of everything you would want. It has, how do you really organize a, a union with a strong base, but also that is smart, that understands the industry, that understands the strategy, and that is able to do a methodological process of a campaign that has an escalation, has phases, has an end, right? So we usually start with a victory and go backwards. This is what we want, but this is where we are. So let's figure out the steps in the middle. Let's figure out what we need to do. We need to build a base. We need to get supporters. Then we have to go public. Then we escalate. Then we get into the deep fight. Then we strike. Then we do civil disobedience. And then we make it a serious social problem, right? For the city, for the clients, for, you know, where media is involved, where a lot of supporters are involved. And this is what you saw in J4J. I mean, you, you just as for Jen as J4J, but um, an ability to orchestrate, you know, um, support that uh, respected people's difference because, you know, we had churches and we had, you know, kind of more anti-global anarchists or whatever, right? But it, the idea was that everybody was respectful of the fact that the protagonists of this fight were the janitors. I think the union's role in this, you know, is obviously putting a lot of resources into deciding that they're gonna organize a new sector, that they're gonna figure out a model of organizing that will fit the times and the, and the desegregation of workers and the fact that we're everywhere. Every time we did something, we took what was good, what could be better, and we developed this model for many many, many years to where we have today, which I think is a very sophisticated organizing approach, which is not about just organizing a base, but it's actually having a strategy to win and having an industry strategy and so on. So, I mean, I think the, the process of Justice for Janitors then became a model that then was shared with other sectors. So, you know, now we're using kind of similar model in the public sector, for example, organizing, uh, you know, uh, public sector workers. Uh, in the healthcare sector in particular, I think it's been a very interesting thing how this model got basically brought to healthcare. For example, in Illinois, they got 45,000 home care workers to be, to be unionized. And that was a political strategy to say, well, okay, if the public money comes from the state and is given to clients that then hire an immigrant woman uh, uh, worker or their family member to take care of them, then I, you know, you pay them. What we tried to do politically was to shift it around and through political leverage, if you will, um, to create something called a home care authority, like the airport authority or the port authority, a home care authority, which then became kind of like the employer, if you will. And so all the, you, all the people that were um, kind of being paid through clients actually became a bargaining unit, politically speaking. Um, in order to do that, we also, and in order to raise the standards, because, you know, here we were workers, many immigrant women uh, from all over the world who, you know, uh, work for minimum wage, did not have health care themselves, although they were taking care of the elderly or people uh, that had medical problems, right? Um, all individually in houses, so, you know, it's, it's difficult. But also we organized the clients, the very clients, to stand up with their uh, caregiver, right, to then fight for more funding. So then my caregiver could have better salary and health care. I mean, if she's taking care of me and she gets sick, there is nothing I can, you know, I mean, this is not fair. This is obviously, uh, and, and using this affection, right, because it's effective work. Uh, how 
uh, you know, these workers with their clients could actually stand up for each other, stand up for better health care, you know, care, but also uh, patients that understood that their caregiver also needs rights. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of some of the beautiful things that um, this model can do because it's not just about the workers, it's about how the workers have an effect on the broad. So, if I'm an immigrant, I, you know, fight for my rights, yeah, and my money, but that is actually going to redistribute the wealth to the barrios, you know, where all the immigrants live in LA or New York or whatever, but also it's the money that I send back home, yeah. Uh, Mexico has the second uh, income of the whole country is money that comes from remittances. So, I mean, this is also a distribution of wealth issue and that's how we speak about it. This is not just about me making money, this is about a, a bigger sense and I think we, we've been able to really have a broader vision that it's, it's useful for this kind of stuff. Part of the, 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 the work that we've done has been successful enough. Um, the, our union is the one that grows, has, is growing the fastest in the world. Uh, something like a million workers in about 10 years. I mean, and that's a lot. In, the, in these three different sectors, healthcare, public sector, and what we call property services, which is where uh, basically cleaning and security and multi-service uh, live, right? This, this, everybody that services these buildings, this both public and private uh, uh, huge buildings and in these in this key markets. Um, we have, you know, our reputation grew um, and globally what started happening is that some unions began asking SEIU directly for support to say, you guys know what you're doing, come and teach us what to do. Um, uh, I know what to do, but what you do and see we can adapt it to, to our own reality. So in 2005, um, I actually was sent to London to help the, at that moment, the Transport and General Workers Union, which today is Unite, um, to do the cleaners campaign, Justice for Cleaners campaign in London. So we organized uh, the cleaners in, uh, at the parliament and in the underground and in the city of London. But then that model um, was transferred to the meat, uh, the meat industry and then to EasyJet and logistics and so on. So the UK has actually become a much more uh, a, a good organizing union, I would argue, uh, the Unite in particular, that's my experience. And organizing has become something of a norm, normal thing. It's not, oh my God, it's a new thing, but people are actually using it in many different unions, in many different sectors and learning and maybe not all the time successfully, but the point is that they're getting better and better and they're growing and they're winning and that's important. So, um, and I think UK in particular because they have, they have a working class, uh, uh, you know, a very working class kind of experience and understanding of themselves. One, two, they came from a shop store movement. So, I mean, organizing was not so strange. It was actually going back to basics systematically and with deliberate uh, resources, right? Uh, at large scales because you cannot just do little things. I mean, then you will just have little things, but if you want to transform something, you have to shift resources. Um, then I went to Germany and did a, a campaign in security uh, apropos of the World Cup and then two years ago I also moved to Holland where we've been working there for two years in the cleaning section in the cleaning sector and then also in the um, in the retail section and we're beginning to kind of have more impact uh, other sectors are really wanting to try organizing um, but what is true is that you know we've we've done projects rather than full-on organizing campaigns, uh, mainly to show and to to see if this model would work uh, in these countries and how it would work. There was a strike uh, of cleaners, the first strike of cleaners ever at the airport of Amsterdam, uh, an offensive fight. So it wasn't contract negotiations, it wasn't a fight back, you know, it was we picked the fight, we, these are our issues, we want these solutions and some of the things they want was transportation pay, some back pay from uh, a contract that, you know, was not paid earlier and they leveraged for the whole country and they were also, you know, were able to win respect. They were all over the news, the union you know, uh, obviously the victory was important for the union to see that organizing works, but also there was something very important was that, um, you know, the workers themselves uh, actually uh, went from 20% to 60% density in the uh, airport with people active. So that's a little bit the story. I mean, right now I've been here for a couple of days. Uh, I discussed a little bit how this crisis will will impose uh, how capital will re, 
reformulate itself and how we could ex we can expect uh, attacks attacks in the form of we got to sacrifice you cannot ask too much uh, you know there's a lot of unemployment so you better watch out because you could lose your job so we expect the crisis to be a tool that employers use across the board to pacify and placate some of the some of the kind of anxiety and obvious uh, uh, kind of uh, workers uh, um, idea that they can actually fight or not. Um, it's true that organizing is important because the workers are not just going to spontaneously do this, especially in these sectors, we've seen that you know it's not as easy. Of course, there's wildcat strikes or things like that, but we, we're trying to be deliberate about this. And I think the crisis uh, for unions globally, in particular, and you know Italy, I think, has to face up to this stuff as well. That the decline of membership and the decline of union power has to be in this crisis. You know, it's an opportunity to reshift, to think through what are the things we gotta do as a union to grow and to grow our membership and to grow our social impact so unions become relevant again. How do we work with social movements, um, not in a symbolic level, but in, 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 in specific fights that uh, we all want to see win, you know, whether it's against a corporation, whether it's against some kind of um, uh, employer tactic or law or whatever, we gotta figure out a way to work together. Um, and you know whether they're in coalition or alliances or you know call it whatever you want brigades. <laughs> I have no idea. And I think labor today will be a focus of struggle. And we need to choose if you know the social movement will involve themselves, but not as a support mechanism, but understanding themselves as workers as well. Um, you know, and here in Italy, the issue of precarity that is not just the work, it's in our lives. And so how do we create these linkages, these, these, these um, coalitions, if you will, understanding our difference, um, but also choosing very concrete fights, because it's not on the symbolic that we're gonna transform each other, you know? It's gonna be in the practice. And I think that's precisely what works so well about the janitors. The janitors say, this is the fight we are building, please come support our reality rather than you know, a social movement saying, hey, let's go help those poor people, right? It doesn't work this way. So it has to be, we have to have agency. We have to be able to kind of move a vision forward and then think through what, you know, how this can link with uh, other groups in the broader sense of the society um, uh, and especially with social movements, which I think are inclined. We are inclined and we understand economic justice to be as important, you know, it is social justice, ultimately economic justice, and we gotta figure out a way to bring those two things together. I think the unions, though, they, although they talk about this being a new phase and we gotta change, I mean, what does it mean to, uh, to change, not only in my relationship to the outside, but in my relationship to workers and myself, right? Um, uh, the majority of union leadership is white, male, and older. There needs to be some kind of legacy that they leave behind, and this has to be about change, about who we're gonna organize, how we're gonna look, what kind of union do we wanna be, right? And I understand a lot of times unions have to make agreements out of a lack of power or vision or political will, if you, if you have, but when you organize, it's not up to you, it's up to the base, and, and that's easier than for you to negotiate and have positions, right? When the base is completely disaggregated and not linked to the leadership, then it's very difficult to have a vision, I would argue. Um, so the, all those things, you know, if uh, unions decide to change and go back to the original point of the unions, which is organized people, have density, have strong worksite uh, committees and workers participating, uh, if they decide to link <coughs> in a strategic way with uh, other movements, in particular fights, if they decide to take bigger positions around issues of education, around issues of housing, and around issues of legalization of migrants, they will become socially relevant again. And I think those are the kinds of things that you know we need to think through um, how these coalitions can actually end up winning the legalization, or winning housing rights, or winning uh, uh, renta basica, or um, you know uh, universal income. Right? All these things, I mean, are, are up for discussion, but we also need to be humble. We need to know where we're standing, and where we're standing is not a lot of power, then we need to invest in our base. That's the first thing, right? 
before we start asking for this, the moon and the sun, it's important to know where you are and what kind of demands you can win slowly in order to strengthen our power. Because I also think when we think so broad that we're not able to understand a, a, a pathway there, so I'm positive, uh, I'm positive um, about what can come, but it will depend on the political will of people, both to change, to, um, to envision a different future, um, and to learn how to work together respectfully with different approaches, maybe different ideological you know, positions in some things, um, different tactics, and I think that is what's coming, hopefully, is that you got to learn that, you know, although we're different, we have to contain this relationship vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a goal, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a process, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a victory. But then that, that learning process will be a recomposition, that where there will be frictions and disagreements, but, you know, just like a marriage, if you will, and I don't want to say that they're going to get married or something, but, you know, any kind of relationship, you might have problems, but you have to kind of look at the, I can't believe I just talked about marriage, I don't even believe in it, but okay, you know what I mean. Uh, that basically, um, you will end up with some frictions and differences and you're gonna have to make a political decision. Uh, is the adversary you know, big enough that we have to kind of really come to compromises in some moments against something, right? And not only against something, but for something. And we are a, a struggle machine uh, if we choose to see ourselves this way. So yeah, that's a little bit the story. Uh,